spies were sent into the land of Canaan as they were in the wilderness, God's people in the wilderness headed towards the promised land. So it says in Numbers chapter 13, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were heads of the children of Israel. So then Moses gives these men the instructions uh, that have come from God and from his leadership, and they go and spy out the land, and they do that for 40 days. They return after these 40 days. <clears throat> and we're going to continue from verse 26. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron, and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. So you can imagine the commotion of the people because they were told by God, you're going to go into this land. That's why they've come from Egypt. That's why they're in the wilderness. They're headed towards this land. And they've heard this bad report. And then you can imagine a commotion because Caleb has to quiet the people. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And all the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. Remember that? complaining against Moses and Aaron and, and what they say, we'll, we'll look into it soon. And the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. So quite a, quite a full-on passage, I think we could agree. Um, that it, there's a lot in there. Let's back up and check a few things before we go on. I want us to notice the difference in tone between the men who brought the bad report to the people and Caleb. There's a, there's a, a complete opposite way of talking and a complete different tone between them. The men speak in doubt and unbelief. 
And they believe that what they saw in the natural, the strongholds, the giants, the great armies of those people in those lands, they thought that they would be too great to overcome. They looked in the natural. But you see, Caleb speaks as if it's a foregone conclusion. They have many words of doubt and fear and unbelief. He has, what is it, a few words saying that we will take that land. He has an assurance. So there's a big difference in the way they speak. So let's read, reread chapter 13, verse 30. It says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. In verse 32, it mentions that the people gave a, the, these men who returned gave a bad report to the Israelite nation. I wonder if you have had a bad report in your life, if you have heard negative news. Often it's to do with health, isn't it? From the doctor or the surgeon, whatever the case is, uh, where we have a bad report. Maybe it's to do with our finances or another situation, maybe your workplace. And what has been your response when you've see, received a bad report? Because we can see the response of these people. Was, uh, what was the response of the people? It was one of they were crying and they were uh, mourning and they were in a place of unbelief, just like the news that they'd heard from the people. We need to remember as well and know that, that God's intention was to bring them out of Egypt, was to take them to the promised land. The people knew that. They knew that that was God's intention. Uh, if they'd remembered what Moses had said to them many times, they knew that they were in that wilderness for a purpose. They knew that they were going to the land promised uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet the people doubted and were in a place of unbelief. Joshua and Caleb, only two men from a party of 13, stand up and speak in faith and give a different perspective. And we, we read that the Lord is angry with the people and he wants to strike them with pestilence. He wants to disinherit them and he wants to make of Moses a nation greater and mightier than them. And then it goes on that Moses intercedes for the people like every good leader should interceding for the people. And we now pick up and read from chapter 14, verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. So according to Moses' prayer of intercession. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Notice that although God forgives and pardons the great sin of the people, there's actually still a consequence for all of them. There's still, as it were, a punishment because of their, not one time, but as it says, their ten times of unbelief. And at verse 24, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. So when I was reading through this just this week, that verse 24 really jumped out at me. You know, when you read scripture and there's a phrase or a word or a sentence that jumps out at you and really speaks to you. And I thought, oh God, if only there were people in this day that had that different spirit in them, like a Caleb, like a Joshua, even me, Lord. Imagine if God, you could say upon me that there was that different spirit in me the way I responded. And that should really be the cry and the prayer of every believer to say, God, let, that, let there be a different spirit in me the way I respond, that I would respond in faith. Because God says, but my servant Caleb, see, he distinguishes him from the rest, actually from hundreds of thousands of people, even you could say from millions. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully. Notice that although, oh, sorry, um, I want to give a word of warning, actually, that uh, when you read this, it's very easy to look down upon the Israelites, isn't it? It's very easy to, what I, what, what I mean by that is to say, oh, I would never do that. I would never, you know, grumble or complain or, or not listen to the word of God or, or whinge or cry about things because really we're all fallen sinners. And I remember when I was very young reading and thought, these people, they're terrible. These people, they're they whinge so much. They, they keep making the same mistake and the same mistake and the same mistake and not learning from it. And yet, 
as I've grown older and look back on my life, I've gone very humble, humbled to go, that's, that's me. But by the grace of God, he's forgiven me. By the grace of God, he does that work of sanctification in me. And he, he quickens me to his truth. So we all read this word now and learn from it and apply it so that in the weeks ahead, in the months ahead, in the years ahead, we don't do these mistakes and we grow in Christ. You know, God is very long-suffering and abundant in his mercy towards us, towards you and to me. And as I've said, we need to be people who when we find ourselves in a wilderness experience, that we have that different response in us. Or as it says here, this different spirit that was in Caleb and that he followed God fully. When, when you uh, read these words, like the, the words different spirit, in the King James Version it says, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully. We can think of it as Caleb had a different outlook. Caleb had a different perspective. He had spiritual understanding. He didn't look to the natural like the other men did when they went to spy out the land. He looked to God and he trusted in God. He looked to the promises of God, what God had promised Moses at the burning bush. He didn't look to whether the Israelites were strong or weak with their army. He didn't look to that. He didn't look to whether they had enough weaponry or armor or whatever the case might be. But he looked to the God in whom they served. And he stood on the promises of God. I want to ask you, do you have that different spirit within you? Or maybe a better way of phrasing it is, do you long for that different spirit within you? We heard from Peter last Sunday to pray, God, show me your glory. Because it's only when God's power is upon our lives that we can respond in that right, right way and respond with that different spirit. Do you know the God in whom you serve? Because if you know, God, that his arm is not weakened and his strength is not diminished, that he is working all things together for your good, then I reckon you will have a response like Caleb. Because you're looking to Lord God Almighty and you're not looking to what you see in the land as it were. We need, we need to be people who have a different spirit within us. Know that we are set apart. And we are called for a purpose. And we are kings and priests unto our God. And I love also that phrase that Caleb followed God fully. You know, you can imagine the doubts. I, I, I think about it and I thought, so what happened when they were traveling back from the promised land? And they were, I'm sure they were talking amongst themselves. And maybe Joshua and Caleb already felt outnumbered. Maybe because all the other men were talking about what they saw and, oh, how big were those giants? Oh, did you see that stronghold? Did you see those armies? And they're, they're speaking of just what they saw. And I, I wonder what was going through Caleb and Joshua. But what's clear is that they followed God fully with their whole being, complete faith and complete dependence. Just like it say, says in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. These other 11, they were focusing on their own understanding. Caleb and Joshua, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So let's reread what Caleb and Joshua said to the people. It's back in Numbers 14. Sorry, I've lost my place. 14 and we're going to verse 8. This is Caleb and Joshua speaking to the people. This is probably after a whole night of wailing and crying and tears because it says previously they lift, the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night and the people are muttering and murmuring, murmuring and complaining amongst themselves. Moses and Aaron fall on their face before the assembly. Joshua and Caleb come before the people. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only... Do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So notice how Caleb and Joshua, they acknowledge God. So in the midst of all of this and what the people are saying, notice how the other messengers acknowledge the enemy and they acknowledge what they saw. They acknowledge the, the giants of the land, the men of great stature. The land devours its inhabitants. They, they mention the, 
all the different nations and where they dwell. They mention that the cities are fortified and very large. They didn't mention and acknowledge God. I don't think they knew the God in whom they served. I don't think at that moment they let faith exercise within them and that they stood on the promises. But notice that Caleb and Joshua, they acknowledge God and they acknowledge that it will be a work of God, not a work of themselves. That's very important. They know that God will work in and through them and God will have the victory. They put their trust in God. They stand on the promises of God. It actually is quoting there what God said to Moses in the burning bush. He said that he would take his people to a land flowing with milk and honey and they quote that to the people. In other words, remember what God promised to us. Remember what he said. They acknowledge the need to not rebel against the Lord but instead to be obedient to his word and to his commands. How often this week and how often in our lives do we rebel against the Lord when we instead we need to be obedient to his word and commands? They, they say, do not fear. How often do we allow the enemy space in our mind to create fear and doubt and unbelief? They acknowledge that the Lord is with them. If God is for us, Israelite nation, who can be against us? Hear their cry to the people, if only you knew, if only you know the God in whom we serve, then you would not fear these enemies. There is only one to fear and it's God. Is this your response, saints, when you're faced with the trials and the strongholds and the giants of life? that you have this response of Caleb and Joshua looking to Lord God Almighty and standing on the promises of his word? What is your response when you hear a bad report? Because it is not easy to hear. But what is your response in those moments? God has called us to a higher calling church. We need to have a different response about us. Ephesians 6.10 says, Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So what trials are you facing? And maybe a better question instead of what trials are you facing, how are you facing those trials? What is your response? Is it one of fear and doubt and unbelief like most of the people in this account? Or is it one of faith and looking to Almighty God? And I want to add that you don't actually need to be going through a trial or a wilderness or whatever metaphor we want to use. You don't need to be going through one of those tough moments in your life to respond in the right way. Do you realize that? Because the child of God at all times should be someone who doesn't look through physical eyes, but who has a spiritual understanding and says, God, show me in my workplace. Show me in what's happening with my family in the, in the nation. Show me, Lord God, help me see through spiritual eyes. And not only that, we stand on the promises of God all the time, not just when things are tough. We should have that different spirit within us where we rise up and pray. And we should always be following God fully, not just when, it, uh, as it were, we're in a wilderness. When I was reading this phrase about uh, my servant Caleb because he has a different spirit in him and followed me fully, I thought, well, who else in Scripture we could describe as having that different spirit within them and following God fully? And... It's like my, my mind couldn't stop running with different people all throughout Scripture. Indeed, there's a whole chapter on these men and women of faith in Hebrews 11, if you want to read it in your own time, de detailing the difference of these people and how they stood out as heroes of faith, as it were. We know the account of David, who when a whole army of the Israelite nation, not one of them would face Goliath. Even King Saul was not willing to face this giant Goliath. He's there and we can very briefly read his response. I believe there was a different spirit within him because he was looking to God. It's in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. And Goliath has given his speech to the, to the Israelite nation. And he says to the people around him, the men around him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Notice his speech is very different to the man. If you, if you read this account, he's saying, how dare he come up against God? It's not up against me or up against our army. 
How dare he come up against God? He doesn't know the God that I know. He doesn't know the power of Lord God Almighty. He goes and speaks to Saul, and Saul's uh, there going, you know, I don't think this is a good idea coming up against Goliath. And he, he tells Saul, he says in verse 37, The Lord, the Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Notice such a faith and a dependence on God. Yes, he's had experiences where God's delivered him, but he's looking with complete faith and dependence on God. And then we know his speech to the giant Goliath saying, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. So in other words, you come to me with these physical things, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. See, Goliath is there basically telling God's people and God Almighty that he is nothing. And David knows, hold on, my God is the creator of heaven and earth. And yes, you look big right now, but you are very small for my Lord God Almighty. And I don't know how I'm going to defeat you, but you are going to fall. And he tells him, he tells him, you come to me with this, these things, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. So he doesn't say, this day I will kill you. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And then he details, after the Lord moving, I will strike you and take your head from you. And it goes on to say in verse 47, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And another mighty man of God who had an excellent spirit in him. The book of Daniel describes that he had an excellent spirit in him. And David, uh, sorry, and Daniel knelt down and prayed, even when facing death. See, this wasn't facing a giant, as it were, that he could see right in front of him. But there was a giant. In, uh, in his time, it was the laws that were coming against God's people and trying to stop prayer. And he said, no, that's not going to happen. He had an excellent spirit within him. The Bible said he knelt down and prayed and gave thanks to God, as was his custom. As I said, even when faced with death. So I want you to notice how as well, Caleb and Joshua, they didn't complain. The others did complain. Actually, the whole nation were expert complainers. And yet Moses and Aaron didn't complain in this moment and Caleb and Joshua didn't complain in this moment. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, what we've got is Moses is speaking quite a long speech, you could say, to the people. He's speaking to them about... uh, what's happened in the past and reminding them. And he says this about, about uh, when, they, when the bad report came back to the people. He said, nevertheless, you would not go up, in other words, to the promised land, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you complained in your tents. We could put it in today's terms, and you complained in your homes. And you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into, deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Lie of the enemy. God loves them with an everlasting love. See, they're actually just, in their complaining, they're saying lie after lie. And they're completely rejecting everything God has done for them and everything God has said upon them. Because they're saying, God hates us, lie. He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us in the hand of the Amorites to destroy us lie. His whole thing is protecting them. And they're just spouting lies. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. As I said, the Israelite people were very good at complaining, but we have to be careful that we don't slip into that because how often do we do slip into grumbling and complaining about our situation, especially when it's hard. It's very easy to slip into complaining when things are hard. If you look at Numbers, Numbers chapter 11, this is before the spies are sent into the land, and it says the people complain. 
Numbers 11 verse 1. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. So why does our complaining and our grumbling make God displeased and angry? Well, I believe it's because it speaks of unbelief. It speaks of not trusting in God that he is in control. And it speaks to our fear, not our faith. Church, we need to be careful that we don't complain. We need to be people who know what it is to control our tongue. We need to instead be people who rejoice and who pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Notice that. Even in the wilderness. Yes. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The amount of times God's people complained against the leadership. We read in Numbers 14, they even said amongst themselves, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Mutiny upon Moses and Aaron. We're not called to complain against the leadership of our church. We're not called to complain against leadership. We're called to pray for them. We're called to bless them, to show hospitality, to show love and to support them. We are not called to complain against our government, even though it's very tempting sometimes, I I admit. But we're not called to complain against our government. We are called to pray for our government. And I'm going to read a page from this book Derek Prince's book, if, you, if you're not reading it yet, I really strongly encourage you to read it because it is an incredible book. And Derek Prince has a whole chapter on praying for government. And it says this in pay, on page 41. He says it much more eloquently than I could. So here we go. He says, we are responsible for our government. And he says, having been raised in Britain... I am frequently shocked by the way in which Americans habitually speak about the offices of their government. In other words, I'm shocked the way Australians speak about their government. I do not know of any European nation where people would permit themselves to speak about their rulers with the disrespect and cynicism regularly heard in America. The irony of this is that in an elective democracy, those who continually criticize their rulers are in effect criticizing themselves since it is within their power by the processes of election to change those rulers and replace them by others. In other words, it's interesting you complain when you are the ones voting and you have the power to change your vote. You have the power to vote in a democracy, which is what Australia is. This applies with double force to Christians in such a democracy who, in addition to the normal political machinery, in other words, in addition to voting, also have available to them the God-given power of prayer by which to bring about the changes that they believe desirable, either in the personnel or in the policy of government. The truth is that Christians are not held responsible by God to criticize their governments. In other words, God doesn't say in his word that you have license to criticize the government, but they are held responsible to pray for them. And it does say in the word of God to pray for our government. As long as they fail to pray, Christians have no right to criticize. In fact, most political leaders and administrators are more faithful in the discharge of their secular duties than Christians are in the discharge of their spiritual duties. In other words, the maybe wicked leaders we have in our nation at the moment are more faithful and hardworking than we are in our praying. Furthermore, and we're almost finished with this page, furthermore, If Christians would seriously begin to intercede, they would soon find less to criticize. Very humbling from Derek Prince. So we are called not to grumble and complain. We are called to pray. We are not called to be a people of fear and doubt and unbelief. And we're not to be a people. We should not be a people that look through the physical, natural eyes of what we see. See, Caleb, remember, had a spiritual understanding He held on to the word of God and what God had spoken in his word, he was standing on. That was his foundation. We need to be people of prayer 
and really put this book into action. As you're reading it, put it into action and, and begin to pray and increase prayer in your life. We need to know what it says in Deuteronomy 4, 7, after Moses had given a very long but very good speech to the people, reminding them of all that God had done. He says in Deuteronomy 4, 7, For what great nation is there, and we are a great nation, we are the holy nation now, so this applies to us. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it? In other words, what great people is there is there in the whole world that has God so near to it, as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him. Isn't God good? For whatever reason we may call upon him, he is near to us. His ear is ready to hear. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, and this is God's words to his people, call to me and I will answer you. Call to me and I will answer you. And show you great and mighty things which you do not know. I love that verse because it's there, God's words. His very words to his children saying, would you just call to me and then I will answer you. It's amazing how the Israelites in that account, they went to cry and moan and grumble and complain. It, it doesn't say they got on their knees and prayed and said, God, show us your will or God, equip us in battle. It doesn't mention that. It does mention that for Moses and Aaron. It doesn't mention it for the people. Church, we need to be people that call unto God, knowing that he will answer us, and then the promise, he will show us great and mighty things which, you, which we do not know. Let's stand to our feet as we finish. Church, I encourage you to be a person who whatever you face in the week ahead, whatever you face in the month ahead, that you are people, that you would be a person who stands on the Word of God and the promises of His Word. Be people, as it says in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. See, Joshua and Caleb were saying, do not fear. In other words, they were fearing, weren't they? They were fearing the enemy. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let's say that, that as a declaration over our lives, over our families, over the way we're going to respond. Repeat after me. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Amen. This is the different spirit, church. This is the different spirit, the different perspective, the different approach that the man of God must have in facing every season, every trial and every tribulation. You've got you to almost stir it up within you and say, God, let that be in me. God, let that be in me the way I respond in every season. You've got to know that you're set apart, church. I remember... I remember when um, Minta and, and Don would come uh, for many, many years ago, but they would come every, every Sunday, and regularly Minta would stop me, you know, probably a, a very young in my early 20s, and say, you know, I, I'm not going to put on her American accent, her beautiful American accent, but she'd say, Alex, you're set apart. I remember hearing that phrase going, you know, almost had never heard it said over me and, and never thought of it. Set apart? What do you mean set apart? And she'd just keep saying it and keep saying it. It's amazing how when you keep hearing something that it, it, you start to think about it and you start to live it out. Church, know that you are set apart. You are set apart for a purpose. Ephesians 2.10 2 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's what it is as well to be set apart. Let's close our eyes and lift up our hands. Begin to speak out a prayer. Begin to speak in that heavenly language. And thank God for his work of sanctification. As we heard in that song this morning, that he's working for our good and for his glory. Even in the valley, even in the wilderness, he is faithful. Lord, we thank you for your word to us today. Lord, I pray that it would bear fruit in our lives. Lord God, I pray that Victory Life Christian Church would be Set apart people, Lord God, knowing that we are kings and priests unto you, Lord God. Oh, Father, I pray that you would stir a new thing in us, Lord God. 
that we would respond, Lord God, in a holy way unto you, Lord, and be holy as you are holy, Lord God. As, as you say, Lord God, that we would call unto you, knowing that you will answer and show us great and mighty things, Lord God. Oh, Father, I thank you that you work in us, Lord God, that you're abundant in your loving kindness and tender mercies. Oh, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you quicken your word all over this building and that people would go home and get on their knees and seek you, Lord, like never before and cry out for more of your power and your glory in their life to be outworked, Lord God. Oh, Lord, we want to just exalt your holy name in this place. Thank you, Lord God, that you watch over us. Thank you that you're faithful forever. You are perfect in love, Lord God. Oh, we praise you, Lord God. Let's give the Lord a clap offering and be blessed, church. Go and encourage one another with a word of encouragement.